In the previous lesson, we talked about the different levels of structure in proteins and how they form a shape. And we mentioned those forces, but in this one, we're going to describe those interactive forces that occur in each level of protein structure. So we have four levels of protein structure. And again, for proteins and enzymes to function correctly, they must have the correct structure, not just the correct sequence of amino acids. We've already seen that our primary structure is held together with peptide bonds, which form the amide functional group. And we saw that when we looked at dye and tripeptides. A question here to refresh your memory about hydrogen bonding. Where do we see hydrogen bonding occur? Which one best meets the definition? So C is actually our best answer because hydrogen bonding occurs between an H atom attached to a fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen on one molecule and the fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen on another molecule. When we talked about intermolecular forces before, we talked about how hydrogen bonding is really not a great name, but that's what we're stuck with, so we'll adapt. In secondary structure, we have hydrogen bonds, and those hydrogen bonds are occurring between atoms in the backbone of the amino acid sequence. For example, we see the hydrogen on an amine group here interacting with the oxygen on another one. And these are somewhat separated from one another. Notice there are many amino acids between those. And that's how we get this alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet. And we see lots of different interactions and that's what holds the shape. So we have hydrogen bonding between atoms in the backbone holding the secondary structure. Now we're going to look at tertiary and quaternary structure. And what we see is there's some similarities between these. One is that the interactions occur between the side chain. So secondary, it was dealing with things in the backbone. Now we're dealing with just the side chain. And we also see that the interactions that happen in tertiary structure are the same type of interactions that happen in quaternary structure to give us our overall shape and function of a protein or enzyme. The interactions we see are going to sound very similar to what we looked at when we talked about intermolecular forces. So for example, we'll talk about hydrophobic interactions, which are really the same thing we talked about like dispersion forces between nonpolar molecules or in all molecules, but primarily seen or the only thing seen in nonpolar molecules. We'll see dipole-dipole forces, same definition we talked about before. We can also see hydrogen bonding between the side chains, in addition to the hydrogen bonding between the backbones and the secondary structure. We can see ion-dipole interactions. So that means we have to have a, an ion plus a polar group. And this is why we classified our amino acids so we could start to understand what kind of interactions were happening between them. We can also see ionic salt bridges. And so this is basically a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion being attracted to one another. And so this is often our basic and acidic amino acids because we called our basic our positive amino acids and our acidic our negative. And those are typically the ones that will form these ionic salt bridges. One that's new to us is a disulfide bond and not surprisingly, this interaction occurs between two sulfur atoms, hence the name, disulfide. Okay. Disulfide bonds are commonly seen in the fibrous proteins in our hair. If you've ever had your hair permed to get it curled or straightened, then what you were actually having done is they were breaking the naturally occurring disulfide bonds in your protein of your hair and then forcing them into a different shape and encouraging new and different disulfide bonds to form between different side chains so that you would either get straight or curly hair. It would change the shape of your hair. However, we know that this isn't a permanent change. And as a result, over time, our hair will naturally go back to the disulfide bonds that it had originally. And that's where if you have your hair straightened or curled, you have to go back and have it done periodically to basically get back to this kind of unnatural set of disulfide bonds that you've put your hair into. 
So let's look at some examples of these interactions that are occurring both in the tertiary and quaternary structures. Now this is basically a tertiary um, structure because we see one sequence of amino acids and what we're looking for is the different types of interactions. So here we see an ionic bond, which we also call this our salt bridge. Down here we have our hydrophobic interactions because we have two non-polar amino acids interacting with one another, so we have hydrophobic interactions. We have our disulfide linkage between two side chains that both contain a sulfur. And then we have our hydrogen bonding here between amino acids that have a hydrogen attached to a fluorine oxygen or nitrogen attracted to the fluorine oxygen or nitrogen on another molecule, or in this case, another part of the molecule. And notice these interactions are happening pretty far away from each other. They're not happening on neighboring amino acids. There always has to be some separation of amino acids so that they can interact well. Let's look at an example. What kind of interactions will occur between leucine and proline in the tertiary structure? The first thing we have to do is identify what leucine and proline are. And we can look it up or we can look at our structures here because we know that we have our backbone and our backbone. And then we have our side chains. So we have our side chain here of leucine and the side chain here of proline. And we see in both cases, we have hydrocarbons, so just carbons and hydrogens. So both of these are non-polar amino acids. And as a result, the only type of interaction they can have are our hydrophobic interactions. Remember, those are like our dispersion forces that we saw um, in non-polar molecules. Okay. So we only get the hydrophobic interactions. Another example, what kind of interactions will occur between valine and threonine? Let's look for our backbone. And then we can identify our side chains. When we look at valine, what we have is a non-polar side chain. And when we look at threonine, we have a polar neutral side chain. So these are very different from one another. And as a result, we're not going to see the interactions occurring there. And so our correct answer here is actually none of these.